Welcome. Okay. Good evening and welcome to St. Anthony's in-person and virtual presentation, um, the first in the series, The American Prophets with Tony Pickler. Tonight's presentation is on Thomas Merton. I am Adele, the retreat and program coordinator here at St. Anthony's, and we have Tracy with us who is coordinating our Zoom efforts. Um, before we begin, just a few things to um, review. Um, especially for our Zoom followers. Um, we're trying to record this session, but even so, if you can just keep your microphones and your videos off, um, it just helps with being able to hear better and have a cleaner um, presentation. Zoom participants, tomorrow you will receive a survey and um, through your email and people who are here in person, there is an evaluation in front of you. If you could please provide us some feedback, uh, we really appreciate that. It helps us to continue to provide relevant um, and good programming and also um, to keep improving as well. There is no charge um, for this event or this series, but we are requesting a free will donation offering um, if you're here in person, there's a basket, and if you're not, there are many ways where you can donate. Um, you can go on our website, Facebook, you can send in a check, or you can give us a call in the office. Um, anything that is offered, we greatly appreciate. It helps us very much. And we need, we continue to be greatly appreciative of the grant we received from the Franciscan Sisters of Perpetual Adoration in La Crosse. With their grant, we were able to purchase a computer, a camera, microphone, and software. So we're able to do these hybrid sessions to um, serve people both in person, but also virtually through like Zoom. Um, so we, are, we continue to be very grateful to them for their generosity. So tonight we have Tony Pickler with us presenting on Thomas Merton, and he's presenting remotely from the Green Bay Diocese. He currently is the Mission Outreach Director for Resurrection Parish in Green Bay, and Tony has served the church in various capacities for 35 years, which includes being the director of the Norbertine Center for Spirituality at St. Norbert Abbey. And he has a master's in theo theological studies from St. Norbert's. Tony and his wife, Janine, have two children, Andy and Megan, and one grandchild, Jack. So Tony, welcome. Thanks, Adele. Thanks. It's good to be back at St. Anthony's, um, kind of, I guess, virtually. Um, I was there in the fall. Um, as, like I told Adele and Jackie, I, I love coming to St. Anthony's. I'm sorry I can't be there in person tonight, um, hopefully in February or when we wrap up the series in April. But um, it's just, uh, it's, a, it's sacred ground. And I've been going there for many, many years. Uh, for various retreats and meetings and um, just feel a, a special affinity to uh, to St. Anthony. So uh, good to have all you here tonight on this uh, cold. I don't know what it's like in Marathon Wausau area tonight, but I know in Green Bay right now it's about 19 degrees and um, warmer than it has been, but not real toasty. So um, anyway, uh, here we are in the uh, warmth of wherever we are. So I'm gonna share my screen just so you can see the, the slides that I'm gonna be um, presenting tonight. And, um, and uh, hopefully they, they make some sense for you. Um, so the American Prophets series was thought about a few years ago um, when I was at the Norbertine Center for Spirituality. Um, I was looking for a series to do, and I ran across a book by the, by the title of The American Prophets, and the book is a fascinating book. If you get a chance to look it up, uh, go on Amazon or to your local library or wherever, um, The American Prophets, it's written by Albert uh, Rabateau, uh, R-A-B-O-T-E-A-U, and uh, it was written in 2016, and in the book, uh, Rabateau 
covers seven people that he considers prophets, um, 20th century prophets in our American history. Uh, not just not just um, Catholic, not just Christian, um, but rather people from various faiths um, who have called us to be the people that we're called to be. And that's truly kind of what prophets do, right? They call they call the people to be who they're supposed to be. So the prophets in the Old Testament, as we know, uh, be it Ezekiel or Isaiah or Jeremiah, who we'll hear from this weekend, um, those guys, those people called us, called the Israelite nation, the, the people to be who they were to be in relationship to God. So Rabbitoh was trying to, in this book, um, point out seven people who he held up. And, and they're fascinating people. And some of them, you know, um, people like Martin Luther King Jr. And um, uh, the person we're talking about tonight, uh, Thomas Merton. Um, but then other people you might not know, Fannie Lou Hamer um, being one of them, uh, Mass Day being another one. Um, so there's some more, I would call, I won't say obscure people, but people that you might not necessarily be familiar with. Um, so uh, what I just decided to do is take a few of those people and work them into a series. And so tonight we're looking at Thomas Merton. In February, we're going to be looking at Dorothy Day. And then in uh, April, we're actually going to piece together three of the people, um, uh, three people in, in one night, uh, two of which are covered in the book and one that I would have, if I were writing the book, I'd add to it. So I kind of took a little liberty. Um, on that night in April, April 7th, we're going to be looking at uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel, who's a, a, just an a amazing uh, Jewish theologian from the 20th century. Uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, African-American woman from the South. Uh, and then Henry Nouwen, one of the great spiritual writers of the 20th century and and has formed so many people with his with his writing and his life. So, um, so that's those are the five people we're going to be covering, and um, every one of them have in some way touched my life. And I hope by sharing their lives, they'll touch yours as well. So, um, to get on to Thomas Merton, I when to just give you a little bit of background about my um, my my. Um, upbringing a little bit. So I was born in Eau Claire. So I'm a, I'm a son of the lacrosse diocese. Um, when I was a junior, I moved to Marshfield. So pretty familiar with, with the Wausau and Marathon areas. Um, but then after high school, after graduating from Marshfield, Columbus, um, went over to St. John's University in Collegeville, Minnesota. And uh, St. John's is a Benedictine. Um, it, there's a Benedictine Abbey there. And it's also a Benedictine College University. And um, it was while I was there, living amongst the Benedictines, um, really being influenced by them and their thoughts and their life and their prayer, um, that I began to discern being one of them, not necessarily at St. John's, but um, to be a Benedictine monk. And um, so I was, I spent a good part of my early college career uh, trying to discern and figure out if that's where God was calling me to, was to be a, a Benedictine monk. It was in the process of that discernment that I ran into this book uh, called The Seven Story Mountain. So I think I was a sophomore at the time. And, uh, and The Seven Story Mountain is the autobiography, the first book written by Thomas Merton. And um, it has, it, it is, change the face of American Catholicism in the middle of the 20th century. But what I can tell you as well is that it changed my life. Because as I was discerning whether to be a, a Benedictine monk, the one thing that kept kind of getting to me or, or making me pause and hesitate was whether or not a, a monk was a person that was so holy that they weren't really real. And I didn't want to be that kind of person. I wanted to be kind of a really real person. And I also knew that I, you know, I like to, you know, I had friends and we uh, tipped a few beers on the weekend and, um, and did what college students do. And, um, and so I didn't know if that fit with, you know, with being a monk. And then I read this book, Seven Story Mountain, in which Tom Smerton talks about his early life. 
And his kind of, not that I was necessarily wild, but his wild side, his, his, um, his, you know, excursions into partying and, you know, living up life uh, quite a bit. And also talked about his really, his humanness and his relationships with, uh, with women and um, talked about his struggles with prayer and struggles with living in, in community with other guys. And it, it, it just made Thomas Merton so real to me that I thought that's the, if, if I was going to be a monk, that's the kind of monk I'd want to be. I mean, that's the kind of religious person that I'd want to be. So I then started to read other works by Thomas Merton. So I read um, No Man is an Island, uh, which is another classic, uh, Seeds of Contemplation, as well as some others. And, and he just started to um, really influence my life. Well, you know, as you can hear from the introduction, I did not become a monk. Um, I did not join a Benedictine order nor any other order. I actually, in my junior year, met my, who was to become my wife, and we got married a couple, a year out of college, and then we had a couple kids, and the rest, as they say, is history, right? Um, but Thomas Merton still has influenced my life more than most people. And I always say, if there was a Mount Rushmore for me personally, of like these spiritual figures who have influenced my life, Thomas Merton would be one of those people. Uh, next month's uh, figure that we're gonna look at, Dorothy Day, she'd be on my Mount Rushmore as well. So um, that's the importance that I that I place on Tom Smerton. Um, I hope as we're um, talking about him and as we go through this evening, maybe you have that same kind of sense that he'll influence your life as well. So just wanna give you a little background um, from uh, in various ways here tonight, a little bit about his story, about his, about his background. And for some reason, my slide didn't advance. So there we go. So um, it's by way of an overview. So Thomas Merton's arguably the most influential Catholic author of the 20th century. He sold probably more books than any other author. Um, his, he probably had one of the biggest influences of the explosion of people entering religious orders and the priesthood in the middle of the century in the 40s and 50s, um, primarily through a seven story mountain autobiography, but um, with some of his other writings as well. I mean, if you if you think about it, in the in the early to mid 40s, if you pair Thomas Merton's seven story mountain, along with Bing Crosby starring in a couple of blockbuster movies about Catholic priests uh, going my way and uh, the Bells of St. Mary's. You put those two together, think about how many people um, were influenced by those two things, by, by Bing Crosby and by Thomas Merton and the Seven Story Mountain. So it was published in 1948, October 4th, 1948, sold over a million copies. It's been translated to 15 languages, um, but he's also written over 60 other books and, um, and he's written tons of poems and articles as well on a wide range of topics. Um, spirituality, of course, but as he moved into the 60s, he definitely got into topics of civil rights and nonviolence and the nuclear arms race. So just like all of us, Thomas Merton, from the time he entered the monastery in 1941 until the time he died in 1968, there's a lot of growth there in those 27 years. And, um, and there's a lot of growth in his writing and a lot of growth in his, in his spirituality and a lot of growth in his viewpoints. And so um, if you read his, his works, you'll see that, you'll see that development, you'll see that growth um, and how he addresses certain topics in certain parts of his of his life. He wasn't, he wasn't talking about nonviolence when he was, you know, 25, 30 years old, but certainly, certainly by the time he was in his forties, he was, he was um, covering topics like that. So uh, a little bit of historical or biographical information about him. So his birthday's coming up, uh, today is what the 27th. So uh, four days from now, um, his birthday is coming up on January 31st. So he's born in 1915 in France. So he's a, he's a Frenchman. Uh, by birth. 
um, is parents are both artists and, and that's a lot of stuff just kind of influences who he is. Um, they're artists, he becomes in a sense, an artist with the word, uh, with the written word uh, as an author, as a spiritual writer. Um, and so both his parents also had this, um, I don't know, this avant-garde, um, uh, creative, free-flowing spirit uh, uh, characteristics about him. So, um, but unfortunately, they both died at a pretty young age. So that by the time that Merton was, you know, in high school, thinking about entering college, his parents were were no longer around. And so um, really raised by, by grandparents primarily. Um, he entered Columbia University in 1935. So, you know, you think about some young guys in those times, maybe um, entering, you know, seminary or something. He's, that was not on his mind at all. He was exploring life and traveling the world and, and seeing and experiencing various parts of life. So um, he, you know, 1935, he goes into Columbia, which is obviously a, a first rate university. And it was while he was attending Columbia that he converted to Roman Catholicism. That wasn't his life now. Next month for, um, in his, um, you know, his late teens, early 20s, uh, mid 20s to converting to Catholicism. There's a lot of twists and turns and uh, bumps and bruises on that, on that path. But, um, but by the time um, he's uh, done with uh, Columbia, he's baptized and receives his first communion at Corpus Christi Church in New York City. Um, in 1938. So uh, very, again, there's a lot of parallels between him and Dorothy Day and the fact that they both were converts and they both converted in their 20s and, um, and both converted in the uh, late 20s to late 30s in that, in that decade. So it's kind of an interesting parallel there. Um, so he's now a, a new new convert. He's doing some teaching at St. Bonaventure and then decides that he's being pulled and called to enter religious life. And so he enters uh, Gethsemane Abbey on December 10th, 1941. And think about that date right there, right? So um, three days after Pearl Harbor gets bombed and, and attacked by the Japanese, Merton is entering a, a religious community. Um, so, you know, obviously then misses the First World War, I mean, the Second World War and, um, and some of all of that. So um, he joins, you know, it's interesting too, he doesn't just join any religious community, he joins probably the strictest community um, that could be found at that time or probably at any time. Um, the Order of Cistercians, or otherwise known as the Trappists, um, were a reform order that kind of evolved from the Benedictines, um, and it was a it was a group of people from France originally who felt like religious life wasn't strict enough, wasn't um, being wasn't um, adhering to some of the strictness that the early um, the early religious, you know, the, the uh, Desert Fathers and, and people like that uh, were ad adhering to. So the Trappist developed with this mentality that um, we're, we're going to ramp this up and it's, we're going to get, we're going to set the climate in our religious community of, of strictness. So if you go to a Trappist monastery to this day, you will, you'll notice a few things. One, um, you'll notice that there's there's silence, right? So they don't they don't talk, um, at least on very few occasions outside of prayer, right? Um, they eat fairly sparsely. They live a very very simple um, austere life, um, and that's developed a little bit since Vatican II, but um, but not much. And so um, you know, Merton goes from from kind of having this kind of the wild side of a, of a, of a younger life to almost the opposite end of the spectrum to sense that he needed something in his life 
that was opposite of that, and so joins the Trappist. Um, he was ordained a priest in, in the Trappist order in 1949, and he took on the name of, or is given the name, I, I would um, more likely say, um, or more accurately say, of Father Lewis. So it's Father Lewis Merton in a religious community. In the publishing world, he was known as, of course, Thomas Merton. Um, so, uh, yeah, just if you go and see his grave and, and such, it's going to say Father Lewis Merton. It's not going to say Thomas Merton. Um, and again, as I mentioned, his, his life developed over time into social activism and really working towards uh, world peace. Um, as Merton developed in his spirituality from it's kind of if you if you look at his writings and that evolution from the seven story mountain, if you if if anybody on this call has read that book, you know that that's kind of a well, it's a person in their 20s writing a, about themselves um, and not the most, I'll say, mature, um, well thought out um, uh, view of himself, right? I mean, he, he was in his 20s. He didn't figure it out all of life yet, right? So um, it's, a, it's a little uh, triumphal. Um, it's a little, uh, you know, comes, comes across a little uh, confident, shall we say, um, about where he had been and where he thought he was going. Um, and then, and then if you track his writings from that point, that, that, that first work of his, which just, just strikes a chord with the country and with the world and sells all these copies and really puts, um, Gethsemane Abbey on the, on the map, um, and follow then a track through his writings, you see this development of, of a deepening of his spirituality. So much so that by the 60s, he became extremely interested in, in uh, Eastern religions and particularly Buddhism and trying to figure out how does Christianity, Catholic Christianity, how does that intersect with the Eastern religions and with Buddhism? And, you know, let's face it, it kind of got him in a little bit of hot water or trouble um, when he's doing that, that's, uh, you know, Vatican II time, and um, there was an openness to exploration, but certainly not for everybody, right? So um, his exploring Buddhism and Eastern faiths, Eastern religions, um, and their confluence with, um, with Christianity um, wasn't why, you know, wasn't accepted by just everybody. Um, the Dalai Lama and him developed quite a relationship through writing. And, uh, and it was really then the Dalai Lama who invited him over to Bangkok to speak at a, um, at a, a gathering of, of religious community members in 1968. So on this slide, you can see the Dalai Lama who is now in uh, his, I think, late eighties, early nineties um, as a, a much younger man. <laughs> um, and, uh, so Merton and, and the Dalai Lama had had quite this relationship and um, and and this mutual respect of of each other and each other's faith perspective and um, and where each other was coming from. So as you'll uh, we'll talk about again in a, a little bit here, but Merton then died in Bangkok at that religious um, convention that that pre uh, right after a presentation that he was giving, and uh, just you know one of the most. I don't know, tragic deaths that you could ever hear about um, in terms of he gets done with this talk, he goes to his room, he takes a shower, and it's in getting out of the shower, he slips on the floor, a wet floor, uh, accidentally grabs a, a fan and elect electrocutes himself. And it's just, uh, just such a tragic death for a guy who um, was only 53 uh, years old and had a lot of life yet to live. And think about all of the, the works, all of the poems, all of the spiritual writings that he probably would have yet to write, um, but his life was cut short. So um, 1968. I'm sure many of you are familiar with um, uh, Father Jim Martin and um, 
but Father Jim does a really nice job of covering some of the uh, some of the really important people in our faith. And so he's got this series, uh, Who Cares About the Saints? And um, in this piece, he, he covers, I think, Burton's life in such a nice comprehensive way. So I've, I've just set this up a little bit with what I've said so far, but um, let's let Father Jim Martin um, share a little bit about Thomas Burton as well. There we go. So much in that um, in that video that uh, for the rest of our time here, I'd just like to break that open just a little bit more. There, he is like I said. The thing that gets me so much is that he is so human um, and shows so many different sides of himself, and and in that way shows us a way to be holy. Uh, we're holy through our humanness. Um, so just a kind of a quick story here. Um, when our, when our daughter was, I think, a uh, sophomore in high school, uh, we went down to Tennessee for a softball tournament. And, um, and so it was a July day. We stopped in Louisville overnight to, to spend the night. And we were staying in a hotel on 4th Street. And I decided to, I forgot about the 4th and Walnut story, right? Um, and so I decided one night uh, the, this evening to take a walk down 4th Street, um, kind of their main entertainment district, I guess. And as I was waiting for the stoplight to turn at, uh, at this particular corner, um, I noticed the sign that said uh, on this spot, Thomas Martin had this revelation. And as goosebumps came over me like this, my gosh, this is it. This is the spot. This is what I've read about before. Um, this is the famous fourth and walnut spot that, uh, that, that, um, that's been made so famous by Thomas Burton and by, by so many people since. Um, and it was on that corner as just to reiterate what uh, Father Jim Martin said is where he had this, this kind of this existential mystical moment of, of, connectedness where he felt so connected to God through the people that he saw around him and so then he wrote these really kind of famous words in Louisville at the corner of 4th and Walnut in the center of the shopping district and I'll show you some photos here in a minute to show you give you a sense of it, it truly was in the middle of the shopping district um, I was suddenly overwhelmed with the realization that I loved all those people he looks around sees these people walking up and down the street he loves all these people, that they were mine and I theirs, that we could not be alien to one another, even though we were total strangers. Isn't that a great line? We could not be alien to not one another, even though we're total strangers. If we had that, that viewpoint today, how different that would make our life, right? How different it would make our world. Um, it was like waking from a dream of separateness, of spurious self-isolation, in a special world, a world of renunciation and supposed holiness. The sense of liberation from an illusory difference was such a relief, such a joy to me that I almost laughed out loud. Can you just hear him um, saying that? I, he'll, he, there was such joy in him to have this, these, the, like the, the veil torn, you know, the separateness gone, and that there was this connectedness that he felt. I have the immense joy of being man, a member of, the, of a race in which God himself became incarnate, as if the sorrows and stupidities of the human condition could overwhelm me. Now I realize what we all are. And if only everyone could realize this, but it cannot be explained. Isn't that what mysticism is all about? It can't be explained. You can just experience it. There's no way of telling people that they're all walking around shining like the sun. Uh, what a moment for him to take then into the rest of his life, into the rest of his writings, into the rest of his philosophy and his theology, and to make a difference for so many people by having this mystical, special moment on the corner of 4th and Walnut that truly, um, truly changed his life. And, uh, and we don't all get that shot, right? We don't all have that mystical moment, um, that, that, um, that special moment. But when we do, and if we do, um, how different that can make our lives. Right? 
so this is that sign I saw. <laughs> I took some photos when I was down on the corner. Um, and so it's marked by one of these, you know, national historical type signs. Um, and so the sign says Merton had a sudden insight at this corner, March 18th, 1958, that led him to redefine his monastic identity with greater involvement in social justice issues because of that connectedness, right? He was suddenly overwhelmed with the realization that I loved all these people. He found them walking around shining like the sun and then um, states that that's a, a quote from one of his books, The Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander. Um, so there I was, standing on the corner um, and uh, didn't even know I was in a famous spot that I looked up. The flip side of that sign just gives a little bit of a biography of, of Tom Spartan. So, um, so that people walking up and down that street can actually, um, can actually uh, learn a little bit about his life. One other really um, kind of a, a funny incident happened to me um, probably five, six years ago. My brother and his wife and myself and my wife went down to Louisville to do a little um, a little time on the the uh, bourbon trail, right? And so we did a little bourbon tasting down in the Louisville area. And um, we were in downtown Louisville one one uh, Sunday afternoon. Uh, the three of them, it was hotter than all, all get out. Um, the three of them decided to go to a bar, have a drink. And I wanted to go back and find this spot, uh, to find Fourth and Walnut. And so I started out on a street, I think it was Broadway, and not really realizing how far Broadway was going to be to, um, to Walnut Street. I start down Fourth, I think it was, maybe it was Third Street, start down Third Street. And, um, and I keep walking and walking and walking and walking until I got all the way up to Spalding University, which is, you know, like a mile and a half, two miles from the downtown area. And, um, and I kept asking people, where is, where's Walnut Street? Cause I hadn't, I didn't see it. And, um, and I couldn't remember where it was from the time when I was there with my daughter, when she was a sophomore in high school. So I said, where's Walnut Street? And everybody's like, uh, gee, I don't know. I, I'm, I, I'm not sure. And I kept asking, where's Walnut Street? Where's Walnut Street? And finally, when I got to Spalding, I decided I, I must be too far. I turned around and I started walking back. And when I, I finally, and I kept asking people, where's Walnut Street? And I finally met this person who said, Walnut Street, this older person says, Walnut Street is now Muhammad Ali Boulevard. And uh, they, re they changed the name a few years ago. And so it's not called Walnut Street anymore. It's Muhammad Ali Boulevard. And so I walked a mile, half, two miles too far because Walnut Street, AKA Muhammad Ali Boulevard, is two blocks off of Broadway. I walked up two miles. I needed to walk two blocks. Um, so when I got to Walnut and Fourth and Walnut, AKA Muhammad Ali Boulevard. I snapped a few more photos so I could show you all. Um, and so I wanna give you a sense of, this is, as I stood on that corner, I thought, this is where Thomas Merton had this mystical experience. This is where he had this incredible connection with people that took him into the rest of his life. And I looked on all four corners and I saw these buildings that I knew would have been there in the late 50s, at least I suspected they would have been there in the late 50s just by the architecture. Um, and so I, I had that kind of mystical moment myself as I'm standing on the street corner that this is where Thomas Merton stood. This is where Thomas Merton had his moment. This is where Thomas Merton had his revelation. So this is one of the corners. This is another one. Now it's the CVS uh, pharmacy. But you can see how old that building is and see that that probably is where, you know, Thomas Merton's looking. Uh, and here's another corner as well, old building, something that he would have he would have seen on Fourth and Walnut. Take a little bit to um, his home. Then um, I've been to Gethsemane Abbey twice. Uh, once was just a really quick trip when we were down on that uh, that Bourbon Trail. Um, we stopped for Sunday Mass, and it just so happened to be uh, Palm Sunday. And so we were able to celebrate Palm Sunday with the Trappist uh, monks at Gethsemane. Um, and, and then I since went down on a retreat, a five, four-day retreat, a weekend retreat, 
um, a few years ago and, um, and was able to experience the, the flow, the life of the Trappist um, during that time as well. So just some shots, some scenes from around what he would have been um, seeing. So as you can see, his community is an old community in uh, just outside of Bardstown, Kentucky, which is south of Louisville by, I want to say, 40 miles or thereabouts. Um, and so that when they, when they talked, uh, or Father Jim Martin talked about him uh, going to Louisville and having this relationship with this woman, this nurse who had cared for him, um, Louisville and, and Bardstown and then Gethsemane are not, not all that far away from each other. Um, here's some of the countryside. It's, uh, it's, I don't know how many acres are, um, are there, but it is a large, large, large piece of property that's wooded mainly, but also has some fields um, in it as well that they actually farm. Um, so one of Thomas Merton's roles in life was not only to hunker down in his um, his uh, private place to write, but also to farm. And so he had to work the fields and do what every other monk, uh, Trappist monk did on the property, and that is to earn their keep. And so they, they worked these fields. It's a beautiful, beautiful piece of, of Kentucky countryside, very hilly. And um, of course, these pictures don't necessarily show you the rolling hills that are in Kentucky at the spot, but um, it certainly is. It certainly is picturesque. Um, here's a shot of the monastery from kind of up on a, a hill a little bit. Um, uh, as Father Jim said, hundreds of guys came in the 50s and early 60s. And so they had to keep expanding this place. It's bigger than, than Thomas Merton would have ever um, would have ever experienced. But the, the uh, kind of like I'll say the foundations of it are what he would have experienced. Um, this is the entrance up to the, um, if looking dead ahead, would be the church. On the left is the guest house, where if you ever go on a retreat at to Gethsemane, it's about a 10, 11 hour drive. Um, if you want to go on a retreat, you'd be staying on the, in the rooms on the left. Uh, the, the space on the right behind the wall um, is, the, is the cloistered monastery. And that's where, that's where Thomas would have lived. And here, of course, is a, is one of the Trappists, and you saw this in the um, photos as well. But um, Trappists are known for their their white habit with a with a dark um, scapular uh, over the top. So um, very coarse material, uh, kind of austere, harsh um, material that they wear um, for their habit. Uh, this is a gate that leads into the monastery, and you can see that the the um, phrase up above is God alone, and that's what Thomas Merton would have been searching for as he lived in the monastery those years uh, from 1941 to 1968. He'd been searching for God alone, um, uh, not not to be. Um, that's that's why people go to places like monasteries is to be able to focus and to pray and to um, and to really center on God alone. And so uh, I wanted to make sure I took a shot there. Um, this is a scene from the church. As you can see, um, uh, there are uh, Trappist monks on each side. That's their choir stalls. And so for seven times a day, if you would go there, and this is the life that Thomas would have lived, at 3 a.m., you arise and go to prayer. And then at seven times through the day, starting at, at 3 a.m., um, you have prayer. And uh, um, so, and then in addition to that, a daily mass. And so the, the, um, the Trappists are, are in an, what we call antiphonal, uh, an antiphonal setting. So they, they um, sing um, the Psalms back and forth, back and forth. And, um, and then the chairs that you see uh, more towards the front, you see the altar way, way up at the top of the um, shot there, uh, along with the amble um, and the tabernacle. Uh, then you have some chairs there for the um, uh, people to, to sit in on a Sunday. That's where we sat on Sunday. But during the weekday, you would experience mass. Um, you can't see it because I'm, I'm actually taking the shot from here. Um, but there, there's a, um, a seating area behind this shot 
Um, that's where you, uh, a person who's on retreat or who's a visitor would sit for daily prayer as well as daily mass. And so um, uh, it's, a, it's a, a, a really simple worship space with, as you can see, there's really no artwork, there's no statues, there's no anything. There's concrete floor, wooden pews, um, and, and people, and people are the art, people are the environment. Um, so that's, that's the Abbey of Gethsemane Church, which is so very, very simple. By the way, if you, uh, if you ever would like to see a Trappist monastery, it's a little closer to home. You don't have to travel, you know, 11 hours away. Um, down near Dubuque, Iowa is another Trappist monastery. And all of a sudden that's spacing my mind what it's called. So I might have to think about that for a minute and get that to you. Um, but uh, I've stayed there as well on retreat. And it looks actually very similar to Gethsemane. Um, looks very, very similar in terms of their church. Excuse me. I was blessed. <clears throat> excuse me. I was blessed one day to have um, somebody from the Merton Society um, show me where Thomas Merton's graveside was. And um, I was looking. There's a there's a public cemetery outside of the church, and then behind the the um, the fence, so to speak, is the Trappist Monastery. Where Thomas Merton is is uh, laid to rest, and I kept looking at these public gravestones, walking up and down, up and down, trying to find Thomas Merton, not realizing that just like at St. John's in Collegeville, Minnesota, uh, the Trappists have their own their own uh, uh, cemetery, and so um, I wasn't finding Thomas Merton, and the uh, gentleman stopped me and asked who I was looking for, and I said I'm looking for Thomas Merton's grave, he said, so you're not going to find it here. Uh, but I can show you where it is. And he took me through this wing and, and out to the cemetery. And I was able to snap a photo of his, of his grave. And as you can see, it's Father Lewis Merton, not Thomas, because that would have been his religious name. Uh, really, ironically, right next to him is laid to rest his abbot. And so the next uh, slide is uh, James Fox, who is the abbot of, at the time that uh, Thomas Merton was there. And as you might remember from the video, uh, Father Jim Martin talked about how Thomas Merton was kind of a um, uh, interesting customer to deal with in religious life, A, because he was so famous. He had written so many books, made so much money for the monastery and had some real strong feelings about monastery life. And he wanted to live in, uh, um, in, in, in private and uh, he wanted to, to live uh, apart and and to be able to really focus and, and to pray by himself. And so he talked his abbot finally into um, creating a, uh, a little house on the property where, where he could live by himself. Um, there was all kinds of pushback in terms of what would be right, written, what was acceptable to be written and not acceptable to be written. Um, so when Thomas Merton's writing about um, nuclear armaments and war and pacifism and the Vietnam War and uh, uh, you know some of those nonviolence and Eastern religions, um, his abbot you know sometimes had a few problems with that. So they they kind of went head to head sometimes. And um, but ironically, right next to each other for eternity, there they are, um, uh, graveside to graveside. Uh, th there's a couple more shots here from Gethsemane. I, I, like I said, this shows you a little bit of some of the hilliness of it all. Um, beautiful sunsets and sunrises uh, in the hills. And then, um, uh, there, as I said, Tom Smerton wrote 60 books, um, plus articles, uh, plus poems. Um, these are just some of them I pulled together um, for you. Uh, some are more... Um, you know, famous, I would say, than others. Um, but certainly one of the, you know, if you were to read a couple of Thomas Merton works, it seems to me uh, Seven Story Mountain would probably be where you'd want to start. Um, uh, I would say Seeds of Contemplation and New Seeds of Contemplation would probably be um, a couple of books you'd want to 
uh, read as well. And there's there's uh, Thoughts and Solitude is fantastic. I mean, there's there's other really great books as well. But um, uh, when you when you have a person who's written fifty books, I mean, it's tough to much you're a Merton scholar to have read read every one of them. Um, but I guess if you're starting out, Seven Story Mountain would be where you probably want to start. That's where he started. There's a few quotes from him. Um, just kind of get you thinking about his thoughts and about about some of those words that he wrote. Um, this is from one of his one of his books. The beginning of love is the will to let those we love be perfectly themselves. The resolution not to twist them to fit our own image. Isn't that difficult to do sometimes? Um, think about the really realness of a quote like that. You know that to really love somebody. Is to, is to let them be themselves and not create them into an image that we want them to be. Um, Merton had such a, such a sense of people, even though he didn't, he didn't live amongst many people except for his community, um, but he had such a sense of people in his writing. Um, this is from No Man is an Island, which if written today would be more inclusive in its, uh, in its title, I'm sure. <clears throat> the beginning of love <clears throat> excuse me, is the will to let those we love to be perfectly themselves. So similar, the resolution not to twist them to fit our own image. So you kind of copy that again. If in loving them, we do not love what they are, but only their potential likeness to ourselves, then we do not love them. We only love the reflection of ourselves in them. So very similar to the last, um, the last work. Another quote. You do not need to know precisely what is happening or exactly where it's all going. What you need is to recognize the possibilities and challenges offered by the present moment and to embrace them with courage, faith, and hope. That takes, uh, I feel, a great deal of faith to not know exactly where everything's going, but to just realize that there are possibilities and challenges if we live in the present moment and to embrace it, uh, quite a challenge, I think. Love is our true destiny. We do not find the meaning of life by ourselves alone. We find it with one another. And he learned that so beautifully in community um, and also learned it through his early life, I think, as well. This is from Seventh Story Mountain. The more you try to avoid suffering, the more you suffer because smaller and more insignificant things begin to torture you in proportion to your fear of being hurt. The one who does, does most to avoid suffering is in the end, the one who suffers most. Interesting comments about, about suffering. Our idea of God tells us more about ourselves than about him. Kind of reminds me of some other quotes I've read as well. But our, our image of God, our idea of God, tells us more about ourselves than about who God is. Interesting quote there. Another one from Roman is an island. Only the person who has had to face despair is really convinced that he needs mercy. Those who do not want mercy never seek it. It's better to find God on the threshold of despair than to risk our lives in a complacency that has never felt the need of forgiveness. A life that is without problems may literally be more hopeless than one that always verges on despair. That seems to me that's written from a guy who has lived, you know, on the edge sometimes and had some had some difficulties in his life and learned from them and grow, grew from them and created more depth in his life from them. As we um, get closer to close here, I wanted to um, share with you this. As Father Jim Martin said, uh, Thomas Martin died in Bangkok at this religious communities um, conference. And so he's speaking to uh, priests and sisters and brothers from various communities around the world gathered, um, gathered in Bangkok. And this happens to be then the last, the very last words, uh, the last time that, that Martin would have been seen is on this, this video from this conference from Bangkok. So check it out. Man, 
living under certain economic conditions is no longer in possession of the fruits of his life. His life is not his. His life is lived according to conditions determined by somebody else. And I would say that on this particular point, which is very important indeed in the early Marx, you have a basically Christian idea. Christianity is against alienation. Christianity revolts against an alienated life. The Dalai Lama himself made every effort to coexist with communism, and he failed. And he said, frankly, from now on, brother, everybody stands on his own feet. Uh, to my mind, that is an extremely important monastic statement. It is, if you forget everything else that has been said, I would suggest you remember this for the future. From now on, everybody stands on his own feet. This, I think, is what Buddhism is about, it's what Christianity is about, what monasticism is about, if you understand it in terms of grace. That is to say, it's not a Pelagian statement by any means, but it is a statement to the effect that we can no longer rely on being supported by structures which may be destroyed at any moment by a political power, a political force. You cannot rely on structure. According to the Marxist formula, in which communism consists in a society where each gives according to his capacity and each receives according to his needs. Now, if you will reflect for two seconds on that definition, you will find that's a definition of a monastic community. That is precisely what monastic community life has always at, in, attempted to do. And it is my personal opinion that monastic community life is really the only place in which this can be done. It can't be done in communism. It can be done in a monastery. I'm subject to correction on this particular point. This is just a personal idiosyncrasy of mine, perhaps, but that's my belief. And I believe that by openness to Buddhism, to Hinduism, and to these great Asian traditions, we stand a wonderful chance of learning more about the potentiality of our own traditions because they have gone, from the natural point of view, so much deeper into this than we have. So I will conclude on that note. I believe the plan is to have all the questions for this morning's conferences this evening at the panel. So I will disappear from view and we can all have a coke or something. Thank you very much. Man. As you can see, um, so Merton says, let's go have a Coke or something. And he's gonna come back for a panel in the evening, but then goes back to his room, takes a shower, gets electrocuted and dies and, and never makes it back to that panel. Um, so again, I mean, a man who was moving towards something in terms of unifying religions, in terms of, of deepening our thoughts about spirituality, and, um, and yet at the age of 53, get cuts, uh, his life gets cut short. So um, I think this will work. Um, what I'm gonna do is stop sharing my screen for a minute after I give you these couple of questions, but wondering if we can uh, make this work. Um, if you can think about these two questions, what is it about the life of Thomas Burton that most resonates with you? Is there something, I mean, like I said before, he's had a tremendous ex influence on my life. Uh, Jim Martin, Father Jim talked about the influence on his life. Um, is there anything in, in Martin's life, in his writings and his quotes and whatever that resonates with your life? And, and then more particularly, what quote or thought from him would you like to focus on during these days leading up to Lent? You know, we're looking up, we're doing a lot of planning these days at the parish here in Green Bay uh, for Lent right now. And so I feel like like Lent's just right around the corner. I know we've got a few, you know, some weeks yet, but 
um, leading up to those days of Lent, you know, what are what are some things you'd want to focus on in terms of his life? So um, what is it about his life that most resonates? And then is there a thought or a quote that you'd want to um, uh, kind of be thinking about? So I'm going to stop sharing and um, I'm hoping this will work. If you if you have a, a comment, um, uh, uh, something to say, I think just I think this will I'm hoping this will work uh, to unmute yourself and to um, to share whatever you have. And if that's not going to work, maybe from somebody from St. Anthony's can let me know quickly, but that won't cut it with what we're doing here tonight. And Tony, the online people can unmute themselves if they want okay. to. Okay. Okay. All right. So anybody online have any thoughts, any um, anything spark your imagination when it came to the life of, of Thomas Merton? What you heard tonight? So Cecilia is saying, and uh, so for the people at, at St. Anthony's, you might see this on your screen perhaps too. Uh, he was real. Whoops, I think I just missed that part of the chatting on one sec. Uh, he was real, was a wild child, lived quite a life before his conversion. And I think that's so true. And, uh, you know, I think about all of, well, I shouldn't say all of, um, that would be a really bad statement. Many of the the really, not, Thomas Merton has not um, begun to go down the role or the path of sainthood yet. Um, not like uh, Dorothy Day, who we'll be looking at next month. But um, but many of the, the saints, to think about Augustine, I think about um, uh, St. Norbert, uh, who's certainly influential over here in De Pere and Green Bay. Um, some of those saints that had such an interesting early life, and then this, and when I say interesting, I mean, <laughs> as Cecilia says, this wild life, this wild child side of them, and then this conversion moment, um, you see that pattern so many times. Um, and I, I don't know, I got to think sometimes maybe that's what creates some of the richness and the, um, the depth of who they are because they've, they've lived to the depths. They've, uh, they've experienced life to its fullest and can now reflect back upon that write about it, speak about it, teach about it, um, and and live their lives, you know, differently because of it. So again, that's one of the reasons why I was very, very attracted to Tom Spurt when I was in college. And again, not that I was super wild child or anything at St. John's, but, um, you know, pretty normal, pretty normal college experience. And Thomas Merton really had an influence on, on that experience for me. Irene. Yes. Um, let me just go here. A, a, cup, <clears throat> a couple of these quotes, as most of the ones that you actually typed mm -hmm. up, um, were speaking to me, and I couldn't get them down fast enough. Okay. But um, the beginning of love is the will to let those we love to be perfectly themselves and not to twist them to fit our own images um, really speaks to a lot of my um, struggle and my experience and also being part of a, a marriage ministry, you know, and looking at what I need to do to, um, to make my marriage work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, that's a really good one. The other one I couldn't get down and maybe you could post it again. I'm not sure if you can. Sure. Um, is the, the one about um, mercy, um, the, only the man who has faced uh, despair. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that whole, well, the whole role of them. Is just yeah, you know, I think um, what I can do, Irene, is um, send, I have sent this to, um, to St. Anthony's, to uh, Adele, and to Jackie, um, but I could also put it into a PDF. And send it over to them so it's a little easier to share so oh, you could yeah. then, you could um maybe ask them for um uh for that pdf um it's a kind of a large um uh file otherwise to share you know but sure, um, sure. but yeah then you could have all those quotes and um and, and reflect on them a little bit more maybe that, a little better thank yeah. you 
Yeah, so no problem at all. Um, yeah, and somebody had asked uh, Jackie, yeah, that would be great to get those quotes by email, and maybe links to the videos. And um, uh, two, if anybody um, is on Gmail, I can share with you um, this slide presentation um, and the, the, the um, video links will come right into it. So, um, so that's one nice way to get that kind of stuff to you. Any other thoughts um, about how Merton might have influenced you, um, changed your thoughts maybe about something, um, got you to think differently? I thought just as I was, uh, just as we had this little pause, uh, that name of the abbey down in um, Dubuque, the Trappist Monastery is called New Mallory. New Mallory, it's um, five miles to the west of Dubuque. So not a very far drive from Wisconsin. And um, also set out a nice piece of property, um, similar to Gethsemane in terms of its, um, its layout somewhat. Um, but the people, the, the uh, Trappist and New Mallory, if you go down there, um, they actually run a casket making business. And so you can take a tour of their, their casket making business. And um, it's uh, quite fascinating. They have, they, they make hundreds and hundreds of them and some of the monks are involved and they also have some volunteers and employees involved. In, in doing that. And one of the things that struck me the most is that when you go into their warehouse at New Mallory, um, you'll see caskets piled in the warehouse um, from floor to ceiling. Caskets, caskets all over the place, different woods, different uh, styles and all of that, but caskets all over the place. And you get to the last area and you see these little caskets for children. And um, the person that was given the tour, uh, one of the Trappist monks said, as he's pointing to the hundreds and hundreds of caskets piled up on each other, he said, this is our business. This is our business. This is how we make some money. And he pointed toward the children's caskets and he said, and this is our ministry. So that any child who dies um, and their family needs a casket, all they need to do is ask and we mail them a casket. We said we ship them a casket um, for free, and um, it's it's quite a place. So, um, New Mallory is a great place to experience the similar life that Thomas Burton would have lived um, down in Kentucky at Gethsemane. If you ever want to go down, while you're at Gethsemane, you'll also want to enjoy their chocolates. And if you like, um, and I don't necessarily, but if you like fruit cake. Uh, they're known for their fruit cake, so they have quite a gift shop uh, that has all of that kind of stuff in it. So, okay, anything else before we close? Uh, somebody said, um, "I love the." I think it's Jack again. I love the connectedness they felt, and that we can be holy through our humanness. And I, yeah, I, I say amen to that. Um, I think, um, you know. Saint Irenaeus and his his famous quote of the you know, the the, um, the person fully fully human, fully divine is is you know that's that's a person right and I totally butchered that quote but you get the idea of we live our holiness through our humanness and and Merton maybe better than anybody in the 20th century showed us that wrote about that and. Uh, helped us to get to that point. Um, I'm gonna share my screen again, uh, because I'd like to close with uh, a prayer and a song. And the prayer has become known as the Thomas Merton prayer. And um, it's a prayer he wrote himself. It's a prayer that I first came encounter, I first encountered fresh out of college. Um, and there was a line in here I'll share with share a little bit more with you after the prayer, but um, that just I I clipped it out, I put it on my desk, and I tried to live by that 
uh, for many, many years. Um, but this is a prayer that's famous, has become famously known as, as the Thomas Merton prayer. And it goes, my Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think that I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. I hope that I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, will I trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear for you are ever with me and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Amen. I, oops, I absolutely, I wanted to go back one here. Um, I absolutely love the line and it has really influenced my life of, but I do believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I can see Thomas Burton saying and praying those words because I believe that's what he believed is that he didn't, he didn't always get it right. He didn't always do the right thing. He messed up. He like, like uh, Father Jim Martin alluded to, uh, we believe he fathered a child. We believe he had this affair later in life. Uh, we believe he was a tough character to get along with sometimes in a monastery. Um, and that he could be probably seen by his confreres as a little self-serving and uh, maybe a little full of himself. And um, so many human qualities about him but I could see him writing and praying these words. I believe the desire to please you does in fact please you. Like we just try, right? We try, we fail, but we try. And in trying, we actually do please God. So I'd like to um, close then tonight with um, a song. And I think I'm gonna close each session of the series with the same song. Um, it was actually written for women's, um, uh, the suffrage uh, anniversary, I think 75th anniversary of women's suffrage. Um, but uh, it's called Standing on the Shoulders. And I think it's such a powerful uh, song for us to think about. And the fact that we have people like Thomas Martin and Dorothy Day and Abraham Joshua Heschel and Fannie Lou Hamer and Henry Nowen, that we stand on their shoulders spiritually and humanly, um, and, and they're incredible figures, human figures, and we try to emulate them as best we can. So this is called Standing on the Shoulders. I am standing on the shoulders of the ones who came before me. I am stronger for their courage, I am wiser for their words. I am lifted by their longing for a fair and brighter future. I am grateful for their vision, for their toiling on this earth. Standing on the shoulders of the ones who came before us They are saints and they are humans They are angels, they are friends We can see beyond the struggles And the troubles and the challenge When we know that by our efforts Things will be better in the
standing on the shoulders of the ones who came before me. I am honored by their passion for our liberty. I will stand a little taller. I will work a little longer, and my shoulders will be there to hold. The ones who follow me. Well, I think uh, Thomas Merton, or he's given us some shoulders to stand on, but um, just as the song says, now it's our turn to um, give somebody else some shoulders to stand on as well. And we're gonna be just as human and hopefully just as holy as Thomas Merton was for us. Um, it's been great being with you tonight. Um, I really look forward to February 10th, where we're gonna look at the life of Dorothy Day. Dorothy, um, also on my Mount Rushmore and, um, probably has influenced me, maybe even more so than Thomas Merton, um, but uh, you'll see why uh, come February, uh, what an important person she was to American Catholicism in the 20th century and continues to be so today. So it's good to be with you. If you can hear me, I just wanna say um, thank you, Tony, and thank you everybody, um, the people that are here in person, um, the people who joined us online. Um, yes, you put your own plug in for Dorothy Day next year. I know we are, we were kind of like getting excited here <laughs> when you mentioned Dorothy Day. So thank you very much, Tony, we appreciate it. And um, thank you, St. Isidore of Seville, who is the patron saint of the internet um, for helping the Wi-Fi in our technology to, <laughs> to help tonight be successful. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, have a good night.